Hi everyone, thank you so much for tuning into my talk. So as you can see, today I'm going to talk about what I learned from a year of triaging bug bounty reports. So before I get into it, let me tell you a little bit about myself. So I have been working as a triager for Bug Crowd, which is a bug bounty platform for over a year now. But I'm also a bug bounty hunter and a content creator. For the past two years, I have been spreading awareness in the world of InfoSec all over social media platforms like YouTube and Instagram. At university, though, I was studying to be a journalist, but I quickly realized that journalism isn't my passion. I was unsure what it was, but I set out to find it, and it was at this point that I came across information security. I joined the local training institute and I did a course on ethical hacking. The course covered a lot of the theoretical aspects of hacking, but the concept had me pretty hooked. But even then, I knew that I had a lot of self-learning to do. So after finding my first bug in which I earned a $100 bounty, I posted about it on one of my social media platforms, which was met with a lot of questions from other beginners. This is when I realized that there was a gap in the market for content which was aimed at novice hackers from a fellow beginner point of view. And that's when I created my YouTube channel. The exposure that I got from creating videos and my YouTube channel helped me land my full-time job at Buckrout today where I work as a team lead for security operations in India. Now, let me tell you about why I chose this topic. So triage is often seen as a very mysterious zone. You kind of submit reports and they disappear into the void until you get a reply or until you get rewarded. So I wanted to share some insights into the triage process to help fill that gap. If you're active on Twitter or any popular bug bounty forums, you will know that people have a lot of questions about triage. Sometimes it's about specific platforms. Sometimes it's about the customers or the program owners and others are just general questions. So I hope to answer some frequently asked questions through this. And last reason is a little bit selfish. I want to humanize triagers because the triage process can seem very robotic from the outside and bug bounty hunters sometimes forget that there's an actual person on the other side of the screen. This is why I decided to talk about my learnings and my insights from the one year that I, I have been on triage. And I hope by the end of this talk, you can see that triagers are humans doing their jobs. So the first thing that I'm going to do today is walk you through a triagers day. So let me tell you about how I start my day. The first thing that I do is check my assignments. So every day, the application security engineers at Bug Crowd, who are triagers, they get work assigned to them. So currently we have a queue manager who assigns submissions from the queue to us. And the assignments differ every day. At times we have new submissions, we have close to SLA or aging submissions, we have blockers that need to be unblocked and we have retests. And sometimes we have a mix of all of these. I also go through my email to check if there are any replies on any submissions that need to be responded. So basically it's just checking what I have in store for the day. Once I'm done with that, I actually start working on the assignments that I have. And when I open a submission to triage, there are three things that I check for before I actually go ahead and try to reproduce the bug. So the first thing is the bug type or the bug category should be in scope. For this, you need to check the brief of the program. So for example, if someone submits a DMARC bug and email spoofing related bugs are not in scope for the program and the customer isn't interested in accepting them, I am not going to try and reproduce the DMARC submission because it would just be a waste of time. Similarly, the asset or the host should also be in scope. Now, some programs are super strict about their scope because they've probably started a bug bounty program only to harden a specific target. But some programs like VDPs are more forgiving with scope. So if a program brief specifically restricts researchers from hunting for out of scope bugs or has specific assets that are listed at listed as out of scope, I'm not going to try and reproduce a bug that's been submitted on an out of scope target. But you might ask, what if it's a P1? Or what if it's a critical bug that needs to be fixed ASAP? Now, there are always some edge cases, but these are rare exceptions and you need to be very careful with it because it also has a lot of legalities involved. Now, at this point, I would suggest you to watch Kudingo's video about scope. He is the director of SecOps in Buckcrowd and he has a much higher view of these things. So this video is full of some great insights about why scopes are restricted, why it may be dangerous to go out of scope, and it will give you an idea about how scope works from a triage point of view and from a customer point of view. 
And the last thing that we check for is duplicates. So at Bugcrowd, we have a process to duplicate bugs. For every bug, we are first suggested some similar submissions, but we can also search for them using criteria like the bug category. We can type in specific words. Uh, for example, for XSS submissions, we have the path of the URL, or we, we may have a vulnerable parameter. So we can search for duplicates using those. It's also easier to look for duplicates for bugs like XSS, Open Redirects, compared to some others that are a little more vague. But we don't need to get into the technicalities of those right now. So now let's move on to the actual triage part. So by now, we have checked our three things. We checked if the bug was in scope. We've checked if the target was in scope. And finally, we checked if the bug has been reported before or if it's new. So now we get to the actual reproduction and the actual triage part. So the reproduction steps are well written by the researcher. The, re the report can be triaged in a matter of minutes, but some reports can take weeks to triage if the steps aren't clear or if there's something missing, because that causes a ton of back and forth between the triager and the researcher. So now I would like to give some tips on writing better reproduction steps from a triager's point of view. The biggest thumb rule to remember is providing steps from zero to repro. And what I mean by this is that you should essentially assume that the triager is new to the application and is not as familiar with every application as you might be. So triagers, especially the ones who work for bug bounty platforms like myself, they have to constantly switch contexts between different programs and different targets. So they might not know every little feature of every app that they triage. And as a researcher, I think it's important to keep this in mind while writing your report. So the first tip that I would like to give is to write short and clear steps instead of writing long paragraphs, because that makes it much more easily readable for the triager. For example, if you look at these two reports, you can clearly see that the left one is very easy to read, while the right one looks much more complicated, even though both reports have essentially the same information. And trust me, triagers are going to be thankful to you if they can scan these simple steps and not parse long paragraphs. So prefer writing short and clear steps instead of long paragraphs where a lot of actions might be clubbed into one step. Now, the next tip is to always add a proof of concept in your reports. If a bug hunter creates a proof of concept and mentions it in their report, it allows triagers to reproduce and validate the bug quicker. Most of the times, proof of concepts are pretty simple. For example, for an XSS submission, the proof of concept will just be a simple link. And once the triager or the customer clicks on that link, they will be able to see the XSS alert fire. Similarly, if you have a CSRF submission, then it always helps to attach the HTML file or the link where we can see the bug. For OAuth insecure redirect URIs, once again, a link where the triager or the customer opens and signs in, they will notice that they're being redirected to an arbitrary website. So these are just some examples of proof of concepts. The next tip that I would like to give is about video POCs. Now, video POCs can either be extremely annoying or extremely helpful. For example, the other day, I received a video proof of concept, which was 13 minutes long. The researcher switches between the notepad and the target application to demonstrate the bug. And in general, it was a very lengthy process. Video proof of concepts are not necessary if you can write the steps well. They can also take way longer to follow because triagers need to pause repeatedly and follow the steps, and it can be hard to get an overview of the bug that way. But if you do want to send in a video, or if one is requested by you, then I'm going to give you some tips on how you can make them as efficient as possible so that triagers can follow along easily. So the first thing that I would like to tell you is to avoid writing steps on Notepad. Everything. Any text that's necessary should be in the original report. You can edit the video to keep it short so that the triager only sees the necessary steps. You should ensure that the video quality is high and everything can be clearly seen on your screen. The video should be private, so avoid putting up unlisted videos on YouTube. Instead, you can upload it on Vimeo and add a password and give that password to the triager so the video remains private. And if you feel like then you can add music and make your video more interesting. Some additional things that I always find myself asking for in reports are vulnerable HTTP requests or responses. So if you have an HTTP request that needs to be manipulated, then mentioning that in the report always helps the triager. 
if there are multiple users involved in your bug then detailed roles permissions of the users so that that can be recreated easily the vulnerable url or the vulnerable endpoint where your bug is and minute details like if the user is authenticated or if they need to perform a certain action uh, that always helps and reduces one step of back and forth and and screenshots added in line with the steps in your report also help especially when there are multiple features on a single page once we reproduce the bug successfully we then check if there is any impact to it which basically means answering some questions like how can an attacker exploit this remotely what is the starting position of an attacker in this scenario which means are they a privileged user are they an anonymous user how does this bug affect the application or does it affect the users of the application and is there any potential gdpr risk so if there is any personal information leaked that would be a gdpr risk for the organization who would want to exploit this bug and why for example it would be very rare that an admin of an application would want to take over a lower privileged users account since they obviously have more power than that user in that case are there any prerequisites for the application which means does it have to be a specific version does the exploit only work on a specific browser does it require a proxy are there prerequisites for the attacker like do they need to be part of the team to exploit this and what assumptions does the attacker make about the victim for example does the attacker expect the victim to just click on a link and that's it or do they expect them to click on a link and then log in with their credentials and then perform some actions answering these questions really helps us analyze the potential impact this bug holds and to answer these questions it always helps to include an attack scenario in your report now i would highly recommend you to not paste information from owasp or cwe into the impact section just for the sake of filling it out but actually mentioning an attack scenario where a bug could be exploited by a malicious hacker also keep in mind then an attack scenario might not be needed for obviously valid bugs like an xss or a sql injection but writing an attack scenario can help you think about the bug that you are reporting and in some cases it might help you discover that your finding is actually having more or less impact than you might have initially thought and this could be because the attack probably has so many prerequisites that even if an attacker manages to fulfill them your finding will probably not be very interesting for them for example if an attacker needs physical access to a device for the attack to work then they might have a simpler and more powerful attack option than the bug that you are, are reporting but even the opposite could happen that once you actually sit down and think about how the bug can be exploited you will realize that it is way more serious than you thought it was so writing an attack scenario can help you discover that your finding might actually have less impact so here is an example of how an attack scenario can be mentioned in your report for example this is a common report we receive about session expiration which mentions that the user can still access privileged features even after their permissions have been revoked the attack scenario here should not exactly be steps to reproduce the bug but it should rather be a quick overview of how the bug can be exploited by an attacker in real life like in this case the admin invites their employee into the workspace after the employee is done with the project the admin removes them from the workspace however because the session or the permissions do not expire after this action the employee can still perform actions like adding removing users changing the project settings etc so your attack scenario should include any challenges any barriers that an attacker would face while exploiting this in real life so after reproducing the bug and analyzing the impact we finally triage the bug so now let me tell you what goes into the actual triage process when we triage something we always leave a note for the client which gives them some quick information that they might need about the bug so here's what we give them the first thing is a one to two sentence description of the bug for example for an xss bug it would be something the first thing is a one to two sentence description of the bug we also mention the exact bug url or the bug origin we let them know that we've checked for dupes and we've also checked the bounty brief to make sure that the bug type and the target was in scope this check this check also serves as a reminder for triagers in case they miss doing that before reproduction 
we also let them know if this bug leaks any personal information so if it has any potential gdpr risk for them and if there's been a lot of back and forth with the researcher while reproducing the bug then we also mention any additional steps that the client may need when they try to reproduce and lastly we end the note with a screenshot or some kind of output like a terminal output just to show that the bug was validated by the triage or so that's about it for how the triage process works i hope this gave you some insights into how it works and what a triager's work day looks like now being on the triage team has also given me insights into how hunters approach applications and what types of bug gets reported the most versus the least and in most of the reports you can mainly see one of these types of approaches taken by the researcher there are researchers that deep dive on a single target on one application and find bugs like privilege escalation which are most common in team based applications there are different users and different types of roles involved in the application and there are restrictions on users based on the roles assigned to them business logic bugs can also be found when you take a deep dive approach in an application the other type of approach you can choose to take is going down the recon and automation path a lot of bugs reported like subdomain takeovers can be automated cve based approaches can also be taken through automation if you are good at scripting you have some knowledge in languages like python bash then you can choose to take this approach to look for bugs the next thing i would suggest you to do is to get to know a platform and what kind of bugs they accept for example bug crowd has a vrt which is the vulnerability rating taxonomy according to the description it is a document which outlines bug crowd's baseline priority rating which includes edge cases for common vulnerabilities so here you can see the different types of bugs that are typically reported in bug bounties for example in the p3 category you can see that bugs accepted under this category are like basic subdomain takeovers crlf injections exif data not being stripped and some cases of xss as well and the same thing for p4 we have some rate limiting bugs we have some oauth bugs um and of course it goes without saying that you should always be checking the out of scope section for specific programs before looking for those bugs on a target but if everything from the scope side is clear and good to go then getting to know that bug crowd accepts these bugs you can take the approach of looking for the same bug type or the same bug category across different targets and across different programs so depending on your style of hunting you can use the vrt as a reference while looking for bugs so that's all the tips that i have from a triagers point of view if you are looking to get into bug bounties and start bug bounties today i hope this talk helped answer your questions and gave you insight into the other side of bug bounty and it will hopefully also help you when you hunt and report these bugs in the future you can stay in touch with me on social media here are my handles for instagram and twitter where i'm pretty active and if you enjoyed this talk then please also consider subscribing to my youtube channel thank you so much for watching bye